I know you are joining us from the four corners of the world here in Antigonish and in different parts of the world. In Zulu, they say Sawabwana. In Swahili, they say Habari. In the Middle East, they say Asalaamu Alaikum. And in Ethiopia, they say Salam de la In France, they say Bonjour. Today, we have a special guest here with us. A special guest because the issue he will be discussing with us is important as is. it is in the 90s in South Africa as it is today in our world. The issue was reconciliation and healing. So uh, in order to start our uh, program today, I would invite our executive director, Eileen Alma, to say a few words about today's program. And then I will uh, read the bio of His Excellency and the His Excellency will have the podium in order to share with us the experience of South Africa and how that experience will shape the rest of the world and what kind of impact it will have in all of us. Eileen, it's you. Thank you so much, Dagafi, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today, either in person or online to Cody Institute, and most especially to our guest speaker, um, His Excellency Reyes Sheikh, the High Commissioner of the Republic of South Africa to Canada. Um, today, uh, it's an honor and privilege for us to be here located on Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And indeed, we have that privilege of, of working with the Mi'kmaq people here, um, but also with Indigenous communities and on Indigenous territories across Turtle Island and all around the world. And as much of our focus is um, uh, in, ter in talking today is going to be about reconciliation, I urge all of us to think about the ways in which we are also contributing to reconciliation processes. Um, for those of us here on, on Turtle Island, um, what's known as Canada, what are the ways that we are also um, contributing to the TRC's, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to actions in really meaningful ways um, and not just in you know lip service. Um, this is really important for us, but even if you're not here in Canada, if you're in other parts of the world, um, perhaps you yourself are an Indigenous person, or perhaps you are also, um, like me, a settler on Indigenous lands, please take the time um, to get to know the lands that you're on um, and to understand um, what has happened with those Indigenous peoples, how we are moving forward collectively to ensure that we are honouring and that they, are, they have been taken care of and that has been done fairly um, and respectfully as we move into what is a modern and complex world. Today's session is another in a wonderful and hopefully thought provoking series that's focused on peace building and reconciliation hosted by my colleague, Degafi Debalke, who for some of you, you're seeing him in person um, on, on campus. And it's, it's, a, it's one of a number of others that we've been holding over the past several months with much success. And it's really important, I think, that we're doing this because I think we can all agree that in the troubling times that we're currently in, in so many parts of the world, we need more strategies for looking at peaceful reconciliation to conflict, whether that's great or small. And it remains an area where as a human species, we have much to do to grow our capacity. Um, a key element of this is to encourage respectful debate that allows for an expression of all views, both similar and different um, to our own, as we seek to understand and find commonality in order to move forward and ensure what Moses Cody would have called full and abundant lives in our families, in our organizations, in our communities, and in our nations. My own experience um, with um, South Africa has been over the course of you know two, three decades now, um, in working um, in governance, security, and justice areas, as well as women's rights and citizenship areas. And I've always been impressed with the, the robustness of civil society in really trying to move for, forward on, um, on you know, continuing a pathway 
um, from the end of apartheid into a, a fully democratic space. And I'm really looking forward to the High Commissioner's um, comments on, on those experiences as well. I remember um, uh, in, in earlier days in my career um, meeting um, the late Alex Borain, who was one of the main architects of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he was such a generous man um, in giving of his time and of experience. Um, he was involved in the drafting of the promotion of the National Unity and Reconciliation Act. He was appointed by President Mandela to be a deputy chair of the TRC then, um, alongside uh, and serving under Chairman Desmond Tutu, um, uh, the arch former archbishop. Um, and then he was later on, he was instrumental in co-founding what is now known as the International Center for Transitional Justice, which is a human rights um, international NGO. And why I mention, um, you know, uh, the late Alex Borain is because um, he had gone, uh, you know, over those, you know, over the decades until his passing in, um, in I believe it was 2018. He had really um, strived to work with um, a variety of actors um, of all of all sectors of all kinds to really um, again share the lessons learned around um, South Africa's experience, not just the good stuff, but also the challenges along the way. Um, um, as it's it made a it made that transition from apartheid, so a lot of learning that can also be brought forward in into you know today's conversations that um, all of us, um, particularly those that are on the call that have this interest in the work that Cody does, um, what we can do at the community level, how we can take how we can take steps to continue to move um, move the work forward, um, no matter where we're located. Um, and I'm excited about the potential of that continuing conversation. And so, again, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today so that we can take this a little bit further. And particularly the High Commissioner, very, look, very much looking forward to your remarks. Um, and thank you again for being with us and, and taking time with us. So, Degafi, with that, I'll turn back to you so uh, we can move for, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us a background what we're trying to accomplish here at Cody Institute. Now I have the privilege uh, of reading his uh, uh, High Commissioner uh, Riaz Shaikh brief biography, and they, his staff have been generous in terms of uh, giving, giving me the abbreviated version of uh, uh, his biography uh, in, 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 in terms of saving time. High Commissioner uh, Riaz Shaikh, known as Mo, has been South Africa's envoy to Canada for just over two years. Mr. Shaikh was an anti-apartheid activist, a former student leader, and an active member of African, excuse me, African National Congress, ANC. He was also a negotiator in the Convention for a Democratic South Africa, CODESA, the multi-party talks, and played a significant role in shaping the intelligence dispensation for democratic South Africa. Mr. Shaikh has held several senior management positions, both in the private and public sectors. His various positions include CEO at Corp Africa Limited, Deputy Intelligence Coordinator, South Africa's Consul General to Germany, South Africa's Ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Algeria, Special Advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the head of South Africa's Foreign Intelligence Service, and group executive of the Development Bank of Southern Africa. All of that bad position has given Mr. Shaikh deep knowledge on government policy, negotiations, negotiations, geopolitical issues, infrastructure finance, the political and working environments of African governments and their institutions. He holds insightful, insightful reflections on politics, business, and development in Africa, the role of the private sector in infrastructure delivery, the importance of relationship building, a strategy formulation, and prudent risk management. Mr. Shi holds a Bachelor of Science, Computer Science degree, a Bachelor of Optometry degree, and a Master's degree in Optometry, all from the University of Durban, Westville. He has also completed the Advanced Management Program MB at the Harvard Business School and the introduction of neuroscience coaching and online course from the University of Pretoria. He is the author of, quote, the NC Spy Bible, 
Surviving Across Enemy Lines, a memoir published in 2020. His Excellency Shaheed is an outspoken top leader, every, ever ready to be engaged in the exchange of ideas that shape not only the trajectory of his own country, but also the global affairs. Without any further ado, uh, I would like to welcome His Excellency uh, and uh, give us his reflection on truth and reconciliation experience on, the, on South Africa. Welcome, Your Excellency. Welcome. Thank you very much. I always get deeply embarrassed when those biographies are read. Uh, I would rather just prefer you say, and Mo's going to speak to us, and I could take it from there. I just want to check everyone can hear me, and all is good. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So let me greet you then in, uh, and I love the indigenous language introduction. The, the, I was very struck about something indigenous languages all over the world. For example, in the Dakota language, you have the word mitakuye o yasin. And it means we are all related. In, uh, in Isisulu, we have the word saubona, as someone mentioned earlier, which means I see you. And I think at the heart of I see you, or the fact that we are all related, is the concept of shared humanity that the indigenous people have brought to us and which we have so rapidly forgotten. And I think this is a reminder of the wisdom of indigenous thought, indigenous knowledge, and how we would be better off in our shared humanity if we imbibe indigenous knowledge and language. Very related to the concept of mitakuye o yasin is the word Ubuntu. And Ubuntu, in, again, uh, in the Nguni language, means I am because you are. And there is the, the right to exist. And I do not exist outside of your existence. And that would have particular meaning when we deal with issues of conflict, when we deal with issues of contestation. Uh, it is not, I exist because I eradicate you, or I exist because I commit genocide against you. I exist because you exist. So the theme and the topic of this presentation is about our journey, South Africa's journey towards uh, reconciliation. But in order to appreciate that, you would need to have just a brief scheme of the history of, of South Africa from its very beginning. So if I could get the next slide, I'm gonna quickly take you through this ever mindful of time so we could get to questions and answers. In this slide, you would see, and I would share these slides with everyone, that, you know, following the scramble for Africa, uh, we have our beginnings of course, with the indigenous people who were there. But we went through many phases of Dutch colonization, as everyone will know, in 1652, uh, the Cape, uh, the Dutch East India Company founded a colony, not dissimilar to what the British East India Colony uh, Company did in India. Uh, and we had Dutch colonization, and it then eventually led to British rule uh, during the Nap uh, Napoleonic Wars, Na Napoleonic Wars, and uh, Britain inherited the assets of the Dutch, and that is how the British came to South Africa. The indigenous people, or the people, the the Africana people, or what we then called the Boers. Uh, which was then a admixture of the various peoples that were in the Cape uh, and then developed their own language called well, Afrikaans, moved on on the great trek into other parts of South Africa, 
And then became the huge discovery of diamonds and gold, which led to the intensification of British colonial rule. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Ati, you can see as I go down and you can just flip it, right? Of course, we then have the Anglo-Boer War, and the Anglo-Boer War was the war between the Afrikaner people and the British. It is of particular importance to Canada because 7,000 Canadians fought in the Anglo in on the side of the British in the Anglo-Boer War. So I, for one, do not subscribe to the fact that Canada does not have a, a colonial history. Well, it certainly has a colonial history inside of Canada. It's uh, settler colonialism. And of course, it was on the side of, um, of the British, as part of the British Dominion, when they came to fight against the Africana people in the, in the Anglo-Boer War, which we now, now call the, the South African War. All of us would know about the apartheid uh, and the apartheid era. Uh, and well, 1948 onwards until 1994, we had the apartheid era. And in 1994, there was end of the apartheid with the unbanning of the ANC. And since then, we have had the post-apartheid era. Uh, and we've been in a democracy now, in a constitutional democracy for 30 years. And on the 27th of April, we will celebrate 30 years of it. Very brief history about our independence from uh, British rule. You had the Union of South Africa formed in 1910. And of course, what, what you actually call the Union uh, was not unity of, Af of the indigenous people. It's the Union of uh, uh, white settler colonialism, to put it crudely, against the indigenous people. And that's the Union. Of course, with the 1931, the, the statue of Westminster, there was the exit of all the British dominions. Uh, South Africa remained in the British Empire uh, since then. Uh, and it changed in 1948 when the Nationalist Party won the election, came into power and formalized the, the, the concept of apartheid became a republic in 1961. And in 1961, that is when all links to the British Commonwealth was severed. But very interesting in 1961, uh, Deffenbaker, the then Prime Minister uh, of, of Canada, used apartheid as a means to get uh, South Africa out. I just want to bring the link of Deaf and Baker to, to, to South Africa's removal from the Commonwealth. So in, in regard to resistance in, in South Africa, the, you know, the resistance has been from the very moment we have had uh, colonialization. There's been the period of the indigenous resistance, which we call the early wars. That was in the Khoi Khoi and the Sun resisted uh, the, the, the earliest uh, settlers. Then, of course, from the Great Threat, there was resistance, which is now known as the South African War. And then we went through the period of passive resistance, where there was a hope that we could uh, find a negotiated settlement many, many decades ago. But that wasn't going to happen as the, the apartheid state took hold. And... Then we had the, the, the African National Congress, which was formed in 19, 1912. So a little over now 100 years. And the key decision was in 1961, uh, or 19, yeah, I think 1961, when we embarked upon the armed struggle, where we adopted armed resistance as the way to bring down the, the apartheid regime. Uh, just prior to that was the defiance campaign. Then you'll know in the 1960s, we had the Sharpeville massacre. In 1976, the Soweto uprisings. And then in the 1980s, we had the birth of the United Democratic Front, which was a broad front to bring all 
anti-apartheid organizations together under the slogan, apartheid divides and uh, the UDF unites. The, that period then was marked in 1990 by the release of Nelson Mandela. But I just want to come to the conditions that existed before the release of Nelson Mandela. Uh, and the point here that I'm making that after 300, and by that time, about 350 years of uh, colonialization, armed struggle, uh, and it took place over many centuries with wide range of grouping, various individuals, uh, and this collective effort to bring down apartheid both locally and globally. And that is where the, the role of, uh, of former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney uh, is so important, and I will touch on that a bit later, or perhaps also in the question session. So here is the, the, the point I want to also make, is that for many people, apartheid was just merely the separation of races. And that is not true. And we call it internal colonialism of a special type. Uh, and we make the distinction between form and substance. And the form was apartheid, which was the separation of races, et cetera. But at the core of it, the substance of it was internal colonialization, where one group of people were being privileged at the expense of the underdevelopment of another uh, group of people. And that is in many ways what has created the challenges that apartheid faces today. Uh, and I thought that point, because often people believe that apartheid was just simply the separation of races, and now that we have democracy, uh, why don't, why is South Africa not the best place in the world to live in? I think it's the best place in the world to live in. But we have inherited the deep, deep legacy of apartheid, which will be with us for a while and it will take generations to resolve. So you can, you can go forward from this one. This is just broadly the descriptions of apartheid. And because we're trying to just catch up back on time, so what were the conditions just before the negotiation? And I think that is really one of the points that we need to understand. Of course, there was this sustained internal resistance and uprising. There were state of emergencies. Uh, thousands of people were imprisoned. The, the security cracks of the apartheid government were in fact leading uh, they, they were engaging in state violence against people. And there was the concept of dual governance in the sense that the security forces of apartheid were not strong enough to defeat the resistance and the resistance was not strong enough to defeat the, the security forces. So in a sense, it was a period of dual power. And the only way forward was for either side to intensify its uh, strategy of either armed uh, violence by the state or further armed resistance by, by the resistance movement. And that became a very defining moment that was understood by Nelson Mandela that if the country does not pull back from that abyss, it is the possibility that the civil war which was unfolding in South Africa would become so intense that no one side would be able to benefit from victory on, on this matter. And, and I'm raising this point because I'm hoping that you are seeing the parallels that exist between Israel and Palestine at the moment in respect of this very important moment of dual power. One side cannot defeat the other. One has all the, the might and the other has all the will to resist. So these are the conditions that prevailed just before the negotiations. And in this regard, the breakthrough happened. There were discussions that were taking place between the intelligence services of the ANC and of the apartheid government. And basically, both sides wanted to know whether they could trust each other and whether if they do trust each other, 
the process could unfold in which we would uh, be able to resolve the conflict of apartheid differently other than through violence. So the negotiations in South Africa, remember, there was this period of which, and this is a, an enormous contribution that was made by the intelligence services of both sides that created at least an avenue to talk in respect of whether the, the, the other side is going to listen and would be reciprocal in regard to the overtures. Again, the parallels between Israel and Palestine are enormous because this is what an intelligence service needs to do in regard to when there is irretractable conflict. So we went through a, a series of issues. We had the National Peace Accord because at that time there was what we call third force violence, which was taking the form of black on black violence. Uh, and the National Peace Accord was an accord to, to sign amongst all parties to ensure that the, the violence stopped. We then very quickly led to the multi-party talks. And the multi-party talks were essentially where the apartheid government of the Nationalist Party was saying they can talk to the ANC and between the National Party and the ANC, they could make an agreement. And the ANC resisted that. Resisted that because you needed to include everyone into the discussion. And the more inclusive the negotiation process was, the more enduring will be the outcome of that negotiation process. So the multi-party talks led to a interim constitution, which then was the basis for the elections of 1994. In 1994 then, through a very unique uh, uh, dual role of our parliament, it was both a constitution-making body and it was a, a legislative-making body, and it performed this dual role for a period until our constitution was adopted. So what we have in South Africa is a constitutional democracy rather than majoritarian rule. Now, one of the principles that guided the negotiations was the getting together and to construct a vision of the future. Both sides, all of us had to agree what kind of South Africa do we want to live in? And once we got agreement on what kind of South Africa we want to live in, we then had to work ourselves backward to say, well, if this is the South Africa we want to live in, what do we do today to construct that South Africa? And of course came that question, how do we deal with the atrocities of the past? And the atrocities of the past became the subject matter of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, which is part and parcel of today's discussion. You could move on. So that's the Truth and Reconciliation, and, and I think that's a picture of Alex Borain there. Uh, so you could see Alex together with uh, Desmond Tutu but, and all the other members of the, uh, of the commission in the back. Uh, I want to make one point, though, that even though the Truth and Reconciliation Commission dealt with healing of our past based on dealing with the atrocities of the past. It was not the be all and end all of South Africa's reconciliation process. And there is, I am still struck by one event which I would like to describe. In the negotiation process, the Nationalist Party would always make the point that they do not have the mandate from their electorate to, to make certain concessions which they thought were reducing white privilege. And if the idea, and it was, I think, President Mandela's idea that says, well, why don't you test white opinion in respect of the negotiation process? So in South Africa, <laughs> we had, during the negotiations, a referendum that was conducted only for white South Africa in which the white South Africans had to answer the question, are they for negotiations or not? And surprise, surprise, the overwhelming majority of South Africans agreed to the negotiation process in excess of 75% agreed to the negotiation process. Now for me, that too is an act of reconciliation. 
It is an act in which those who enjoy privilege are willing to say they are prepared to share that privilege. They are prepared in the interest of a shared humanity to be able to construct a better life for all in South Africa, which is essentially what our constitution is about. The, the key feature of the, the truth and reconciliation process included the amnesty provision, victim testimony, public hearing, human rights violation provision, and recommendations, and then the final report. But here's the issue. And the nub of the reconciliation was in, through the TRC committee is how do we deal with the atrocities and the gross human rights violations of the past? Well, the answer was everyone would have to admit what they did fully, transparently as possible, but fully in front of everyone. They have to admit they did what they did. Secondly, they had to relate that to a political objective. It had to be related to either uh, the resistance to apartheid or in furtherance of the Nationalist Party goal of apartheid. So they had to relate it to a political objective. They had to confess the truth. And no matter the nature of the gross human rights violation, no matter the nature, and they were horrific, 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 horrific acts. The law said that if they met those two conditions, they were given uh, amnesty. And many people applied for amnesty. Many people got that amnesty. And there are many people who did not apply for amnesty and are today being confronted by, by retributive, uh, retributive justice. And I will touch on that perhaps in the question. Many things happened in the TRC Essentially, it was an, a, a, a quite a vital process in the country. A lot of South Africans had to confront for the first time what was happening in South Africa. Uh, willful blindness was confronted in the truth telling, which was all televised. There was many sessions which were open to the public. Uh, and many stories had to be told. And of course, for the first time, in, in, in South Africa's history, victims of apartheid who suffered gross human rights violations were recognized. And that's the other important thing about our TRC process was the recognition of the hurt towards victims of gross human rights violation. Now I make the separation between the word recognition and acknowledgement. So, for example, we had the acknowledgement read out to us today, but I'm, for one, am very critical about whether we are truly in Canada recognizing the gross human rights violations that were perpetuated against the indigenous people, but I'm a diplomat, so I have to say that politely. So, of course, there were certain weaknesses of the TRC, and part of the weaknesses of the TRC was that there were limited number of prosecutions, uh, there was unequal representation, uh, and there's a general feeling that the society still remained divided in terms of the past. And I and I and I would say yes, all of that is true. But the key to understand South Africa's uh, process of negotiations or South Africa's transition from apartheid to a uh, uh, constitutional democracy was that it was born out of negotiations. And negotiations is at best partial victory. And partial victory is where you accept that yes, all we are laying is the basis for us to be a better society. And most of us who were victims of apartheid, having gone through a horrific experience of apartheid, had to put that aside in order for the common good to move our country forward. And of course, that left behind in many of us a lingering trauma. And one of my criticisms of the TRC is that, well, my criticism of the, the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa we were all so much in a hurry 
to get to the rainbow nation that we developed a very masculine approach to reconciliation, which is we bear it. Instead of sharing it, instead of uh, telling our stories in ways in which did not seek to blame, but in ways that could have dealt with our trauma, our deep felt trauma. And I believe much of the anger, much of the anger that we see today in South Africa that reflects itself in violence is the result of this generational trauma being carried forward. So yes, there are some weaknesses to the TRC process, but I don't think those weaknesses can be laid at the door of the TRC itself. It has to be laid the nature of our negotiations, the nature of our transition, and what we as South Africans were willing to do after democracy about continuing the healing process. We have had a long, long, long shadow of apartheid, uh, massive uh, human rights violation. We, we don't know the full stories of what is happening, but we have entered a period of where people are now starting to tell their stories, perhaps it is easier to tell their stories now after 30 years of democracy, not because of fear that they could not tell the stories, but because of the trauma. Uh, and it does take a long time for the trauma to heal before you have the courage to confront that trauma and to talk about it in a way that expands the common good. Uh, I think I am almost at the end now, if I'm not mistaken, as we have a range of photographs that we want to show you. Uh, oh, yes, here's the issue of retributive justice or restorative justice. Now, you would know that retributive justice says someone committed a crime, they must be punished. Restorative justice is, okay, what are the lessons we can learn? How can we heal our people? How can we go forward? And without uh, any apology, we accepted the restorative justice approach to reconciliation. And of course, for those who didn't, for those who didn't apply for amnesty, and if there is evidence that they committed human rights violence, now there will be the issue of re uh, retributive ju justice. And there are many people who are being currently in South Africa charged for human rights violations for which they did not apply for amnesty when there was the window period of amnesty. So all the rest of the slides deal with what does the act says, and I think Eileen is, is an expert on that. There's the, the word of Alex Borain there also mentioned. Uh, so I think this, this is significantly covered. So let me, let me turn to then what I promise I will do in respect of, uh, of Brian Mul uh, Mulrooney. Uh, we, can, we can just move the slides on because uh, I've covered much of these issues. Uh, so in respect to Brian Mulrooney and why it was so important for what he did, and I call it, essentially I call it Mulrooney's courage because he had the courage at a particular time uh, being the conservative that he is or was, uh, but notwithstanding that his values for shared humanity, apartheid genuinely repulsed him. And he spoke out against apartheid, and he spoke out against apartheid at a time in which the, the Margaret Thatcher-led UK government and the Reagan-led uh, US administration were quite fortified in their support of apartheid. And what he did when he spoke out, he broke the Im impunity, the impunity both of those who supported apartheid and those who were perpetuating apartheid. And that made a massive difference in respect of the Commonwealth. It made a massive difference in giving the, the international campaign to isolate apartheid South Africa a boost. And because of that, and because of his role, his demand for the release of Nelson Mandela for imposing sanctions, Canadian sanctions and Commonwealth sanctions on apartheid South Africa, we, we honored him with the, what is called the National Award as an esteemed member 
of the Companions of O.R. Tambo, which is the highest national award that we can give to a foreign citizen. And we gave that to him in recognition of his remarkable courage at the time we needed it most. And of course, again, if you draw the parallels between Israel and Palestine, how much that part of the world is in need of moral clarity and in need of courage. So I must end this by telling you that I joined the revolution as a young boy at about 16 years old. I never believed in negotiation, but the day I was introduced to negotiations by President Mandela as the leader of the ANC and he included me in the negotiation process, I changed. I, I came to see the value of negotiations and I now accept that there's not a single conflict in the world that cannot be solved by negotiation. I wanted to talk to you about the rules-based international order. I don't know whether that slide is here, no, uh, but perhaps that could come up in questions about the rule-based international order, which I also don't agree with. I agree with the international order uh, and international law. I believe in multilateralism, and, and this is what South Africa is doing in respect of ensuring that the rules of multilateralism produces a greater equitable world, a more peaceful world around which we can deal with the challenges we face in the world, be they climate change, be they inequality, be they the, the ravages of, of uh, globalized financial capitalism, all of that requires greater international cooperation. And of course, if you are to have greater in international cooperation, we've got to end the stupid wars of the day. And I include in those stupid wars, the war of uh, Russia in Ukraine, uh, what is happening in Palestine, Israel, and God forbid if there's ever going to be a war in, in, in the South China seas, which have just propelled the world into another level of chaos. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, South Africa has a very long and complicated history, and you have given us that history, uh, in, in an abbreviated version of that history, very fully and very uh, uh, informative information you have shared with us with the context of history and challenges and opportunities. Before I turn into the Q&A session, I would like to share with you, me growing up in Ethiopia as a young boy, we learned the names of Mandela, Bishop Tutu, Zinzi Mandela, Biko, uh, so on and so forth. We remember their stories. We listened to Zinzi Mandela's message, her father's message through radio, and I remember we remember every details of ANC's struggle, and we made it our struggle too. In his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was also chairperson of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, said this. If you asked even the most sober students of South African affairs what they thought was going to happen to South Africa a few years ago, then almost universally, they predicted the most ghastly catastrophe would be for us. That would be a devastated by a black bat. It did not happen, Archbishop Yen to say. And instead, the world watched with amazement, indeed awe at the long lines of South Africans of all races, snaking their way to their polling booths on April 27, 1994, a month from today, that would be 30 years. And they thrilled as they witnessed Nelson Mandela being inaugurated as the first democratically elected president of South Africa on May 10th, 1994. This is a book of his inauguration. I have a copy, original copy, which was given to me a long time ago. And early, and nearly everyone described what they were witnessing, a virtually bloodless, reasonably peaceful transition from injustice and oppression to freedom and democracy. That 
is a miracle. Archbishop Del Motutu said. Also, this book I recommend strongly. Who want to learn about South Africa's reconciliation process? Del Motutu's book, No Future Without Forgiveness, and Nathan Mandela's autobiography by Anthony Simpson, which is a valuable document. Now, do we have questions online? Yes, we have questions online. So one question is, as the indigenous people play a key role in the history of South Africa and every country, why do UN Peace Council not share the peace building reconciliation to overcome worldwide political challenges? Did you hear the question, Your Excellency? Can you repeat the question? I understood the question to mean uh, why is the world not using the reconciliation methodology of indigenous people to bring peace in the world? Do I understand? That's, the way, that's the way I understand it as well. Yes. Okay. So I think that's a very, very, very important question. And I think it goes into our understanding of the distribution of power in the world right now. And this is why I want to wanted to, to speak, and it's unfortunate that our systems collapsed. I wanted to speak about the rule-based international order uh, because essentially what we do have for a long time in the world, but at least from 1945 onwards to now, we have a distribution of power where the world order is shaped by the global north. It is shaped by dominant forces. It is shaped by, by the global north in its interest, in its interest, and it seeks to maintain that hegemony over all others. Now, part of the others is the indigenous people of the world. So the difficulty we have is that up until now, we did not have the voice of the South that was willing to challenge this hegemonic power of the global North. And I think what we are starting to see is that the, the, the South is no longer keeping quiet, and I include in the global South, all the people of the indigenous world uh, are starting to raise their voices. They want to be recognized. They want to be included. And here's the thing. Indigenous people have been resolving conflicts for thousands of years before settler domination took place. And I think the world can, in fact, benefit from the peace building uh, efforts and the, the, the resolution of conflict in non-antagonistic ways. So yes, I am very supportive of that. And I think, I think we are coming to a very unique turning point in history where the voices of indigenous people will start to matter much more than it did in previous histories of the world. Your Excellency, let me, let me pose my own question here um, in terms of reconciliation and the, the role of leadership and the role of leaders. Uh, most of the challenges we face today is that when uh, some political parties or some organizations uh, fight for justice and, and equality and democracy, but they are not fighting with equal vigor, with equal commitment to reconciliation and healing. And the process ends at the political victory or a military victory. My question to you, Your Excellency, is the role of Nelson Mandela himself and the ANC in terms of taking the risk of reconciliation, moving the country to different places. How do you see that 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 symbolic and practical leadership, President Nelson Mandela showed when he showed up at uh, at the rugby game in in, in Johannesburg, or uh, how he invited his captors or those who put him in, in in guards or the lawyers at his inauguration for lunch. So how 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 South Africa sees that is is almost clean commitment to reconciliation and healing. So here's the thing about President Nelson Mandela. He, he took all of us, all of us, including us from the ANC. He took us kicking and screaming into the negotiation process. 
because he arrived at the very clear view that the future of South Africa depends on the ability of the leadership of the ANC to be able to embrace negotiations with the other side and to construct a better society for all. And he, and remember, he was a founding member of the armed resistance movement. And he was in prison when he came to that moment that the future of South Africa is dependent on the ability of all political parties to negotiate a better future. And to, neg to negotiate a better future, it had to be based on reconciliation. It had to be based on the concept of mitaku ye o yasin. We are all connected. We are all one. It had to be based on the basis of Ubuntu, that I exist because you are, and because you are, I exist. And because of the interdependency of our humanity, which gives us our shared humanity, we have no other choice but to reconcile. And the most amazing thing about the reconciliation process in South Africa, and which I wish I could share to the rest of the world, that the day you adopt reconciliation as a way of life, as a way of life, all the prejudices, all the biases, all the things that you held on dear become so meaningless. And then you start to look at the other in very, very different lights. So it is hard, you know, no matter, I can tell you today that even I was the subject of terrible torture. But I hold no grudge. I hold no anger. I hold no nothing against any South African in respect of the past. So when you embrace reconciliation as a way of life, you truly embrace liberation. And liberation is a fantastic thing. It's not only the liberation for your political rights or your economic rights. It's also the liberation from the tyranny of your biases, the tyranny of your stereotypes that holds you back as a human being, to contribute your full potential to the glory of the world. Thank you, Your Excellency. Any questions out here? Are there any questions, please? Well, this might take it in a different direction. Am I? Can you hear that question coming? So I can say it. In my yeah, sure. So I'm, um, I'm wondering if you would be able to speak to. South Africa's actions recently with respect to uh, Palestine and uh, asking the UN to act on that. Did you hear that? So Did the reasons that? behind South Africa's uh, taking the matter to the ICJ and what about the US and the US? Just the UN. UN. The UN. Oh, and the UN, UN. yeah. Okay, so, so that matter for us was again a, a moment of moral clarity, which we borrowed from what I called uh, Mulroney's courage. Uh, because Mulroney did exactly the same thing to apartheid South Africa, what democratic South Africa has done to apartheid Israel. Now, after the October 7th, and let me just say, to pass the test of let's condemn Hamas. I categorically condemn Hamas for the atrocities that were committed on the 7th of October. Uh, it is not our style of armed resistance. We have never done that. We have never taken uh, uh, soft targets and, and it was a principle within the military wing of the African National Congress that we will not engage in as a direct act uh, against civilian targets. But having said that, what we saw post the 7th of October was simply unacceptable to us. In the name of the right to self-defense, it became very, very clear that Israel was raging. It was raging against the Palestinians. 
all of the Palestinians, not making any uh, clear separation between Hamas. It, it became all of the Palestinians. And that rage, that rage, based on the concept that the Palestinians are the children of a lesser God, and that the Palestinians are people who needed to be exterminated from the land of Palestine. Now, when we started to see that, what could we as a small country do other than, than apply the, 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 the provisions of, of, uh, of international law? And we then thought we must take this matter up before the ICJ. So it was in order to, to stop the genocide in, in, in a way to get Israel to reflect on the errors of its way, it was also in part to get the allies of Israel to, to think about their just support for this genocidal action and whether we could in fact be able to create the momentum for, for the conditions for a possible turnaround in respect of a peaceful path to that conflict rather than going through the genocidal wars that was leading to so much suffering and so much killing and unnecessarily killings that were taking place. Not that they are necessary killings, but such unnecessary war that could be resolved by one other way. So that was our motivation. But of course, the moment we, we took that step, and yeah, I mean, I know many of you will have difficulty in understanding it because we didn't understand it. We didn't understand the enormity of what we were doing. We were simply following our own belief that there has to be another way to resolve this problem. And what we are seeing is unacceptable to our own understanding of humanity, is unacceptable to our own history of struggle, and we brought the matter before the ICJ. Of course, the consequences were not anything that we imagined, not anything we imagined. Uh, it created an awakening, it created a, an opening, it created the basis for other countries, for civil society, et cetera, to rally behind the cause to cease fire now and, and to really concretely deal with the peaceful efforts to establish the, the self-determination of the Palestinian people. So am I proud of what South Africa has done? Unbelievably and remarkably so. Uh, and I, I don't think there's a single diplomat in South Africa right now who does not rejoice uh, our efforts at the ICJ. And, and, I think, and I think it was the right thing to do. And again, I bring it back to Mulroney's courage. It was not easy for him to do what he did in the context of Margaret Thatcher, in the context of Ronald Reagan, in the context of his own party members not agreeing with him. But he did what he did. He did what he did because it was moral courage to do so. And I think the same applies to us, moral courage. And I'm so proud uh, to belong to a country that had the moral courage at the time in which humanity and, and the future of humanity is so much at stake that we acted on the right side of history. Thank you, Vincent. Any other questions? Is there a follow up or a follow up question? No, it's different. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. It's all right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was interested in you saying not enough marginalized groups were involved in the truth and reconciliation commission. And I wondered if you could uh, speak to an example of that and outcomes. Did, did you hear the question, Your Excellency? The way I understand the question is that not enough marginalized groups were involved in the reconciliation process um, in the TRC, and should that have been expanded? No. Example. Can you offer an example of that of that statement? <laughs> you had mentioned in your talks about the not enough marginalized were included in the TRC. Can you give us an example of? who the marginalized might be? Yes, well, the, the, for me, 
for me, the big issue is this, that the, the founding act of the TRC, and that is why I separate the TRC from the process of truth and reconciliation in the country. The TRC was the committee established in order to deal with gross human rights violations of the past based on truth telling, linking it to a political objective, etc. But true reconciliation in South Africa is an ongoing process. You have to deal with the question of the land, how land was taken, how do you give land back? How do you establish tribal rights or rights of the indigenous people in a modern democracy? And how do you make sure that those rights are accepted? So my, my criticism is that we should have broadened out the process of reconciliation beyond the act. I think the act was very necessary to deal with the gross human rights violations, but the underdevelopment that, de that, that resulted because of apartheid, because of, of people losing uh, culture, losing heritage, losing their land, losing their property, those issues are unfolding. Those issues, again, are still quite difficult to discuss in my country. Uh, we have various opinions about that. Uh, you know, should the land be redistributed? How will that redistribution process occur? And how can that lead to reconciliation? So my view then is that in our, and correctly so, in our need to establish a constitutional democracy, we, we assume that everyone will be wonderfully happy under democracy. But what we are discovering that the real processes of reconciliation are longer, time-bound, has to be deeper. And, and whilst we have constitutional entities that deals with uh, chapter nine institutions that deal with you know, gender violence, uh, gender rights, et cetera, and the socioeconomic rights, I think we could have done much more as a society, as a society, to be able to grapple with our past. Uh, now, is it over? I don't think it's over. I think it can continue. Uh, we're starting to tell our stories. It's very important to tell our stories. Uh, and the more we do that, the more we'll get to know South Africans a bit better. Of course, what does affect us is that the push to modernity, the rapid rise of, of modern things in our society globally often cause us to, to deal with how do we survive in the present. Uh, and I think that is where, where, and I liken it to, and I'm sorry I'm using this, uh, this analogy, I liken it to grape juice and red wine. So grape juice is you know, sweet, it's quick, you press the grape, you get the juice. Red wine takes a longer time, it matures, you need to take care of it, you need to take care of the bottling and so forth. So the process of rushing to democracy to the, to the grape juice process and now trying to benefit the red wine process to mature that democracy in deeper ways to the red wine process. So we're always having to deal with this constant issue of the demands of the presence and the requirements of the past. So another online question, um, talking about the difference between the South African and Canadian reconciliation process. What could Canada learn from the South African experience? Uh, do you see weaknesses when the Canadian reconciliation process diplomatically answered that question, of course. Okay, so the the thing that strikes me quite sharply in Canada is that you don't see indigenous people. 
And you don't see indigenous people because they kept on, and I want to use this word, reservations. Now, there's a debate about who introduced that word to South Africa. Did it come from the British who brought it here? And then the British also brought it into South Africa because the similarities of moving indigenous people onto reservations was remarkably similar, both in South Africa and in Canada. And the belief of the settler colonialism was that indigenous people should live their lives in these reservations. But we call them the, in, the invisible corridors of apartheid. So when you travel in South Africa, you can stay on particular highways in which you don't see any of the informal settlements that you know that the majority of people live in in South Africa. You don't, you can, you can avoid it altogether, of course, but the urban creep has brought it out where it is now very visible. So there's something about what I call settler architecture, settler planning, where indigenous people are far away and almost invisible from where the, uh, the rest of the population lives. And because they are made invisible, they are rendered invisible. So you do not see the challenges the indigenous people face. But every time I read the Global Mail, every time I read Tanya Talaga, I, I get a sense every time I read the books that we are all related, uh, this is my family, and all the books written by indigenous people, you get a sense of the kind of socioeconomic pathology that's been visited on the indigenous people of Canada in a country that claims to uphold human rights. And somehow this stands out to me that this process still needs to be resolved and whatever we can share, we will share. But here's the thing, when we adopted our constitution in 1996, we borrowed extensively, extensively, on the Canadian experience of the Canadian constitution. One of the things that we introduced in South Africa as part of the reconciliation was any law, any law that discriminated against any South African had to be abolished. Now, think about this. Any law that discriminates against any South African had to be abolished. On your books, you still have the Indian Act. How painful that you still call it the Indian Act. Why does it exist? What is the purpose of it? How can you address that in a different way? And there's been so many constitutions, so many Supreme Court rulings on the rights of indigenous people. Some of those things are not taken into the process of governance, into the process of the federal and provincial government. So that is where I'm gonna stop because don't set me off on this matter. Uh, I feel extremely strong about this, that the reconciliation process in Canada, if it's ever begun, has been stopped so rapidly that what you have, the indigenous people today feeling that they are sharing their lands with, with settler communities who are simply not grateful in respect of the sharing. Uh, and, and I feel for them. I, I honestly feel for them. And if there's anything that we could do, and this is where we are a bit diplomatic, where yeah, so we would want to discuss these issues. And I know that there have been some brave Canadian diplomats who have been engaging with South Africa about how we could share some experience about truth and reconciliation. And truth and reconciliation, reconciliation is not an event. It is a generational process. It will go on past my life It'll go on past my children's life. And it is a dream that one day 
that all peoples living in Canada, all peoples living in South Africa will see each other as peoples. And our ethnic origins will matter not. But that is a deliberate thing. You have to be committed to eradicate the legacy of settler colonialism, both here in Canada, and we have to be committed to eradicate the legacy of internal colonialism in South Africa. Because if you do not, you will visit that trauma onto the next generation that will carry it onto the next generation. And here's the thing, the population of the indigenous people in Canada is today at 4.9% and rising. So that's the good thing. That should be embraced. And there should be more dialogue and more dialogue with indigenous people to be able to address the problems. I mean, you can't, I mean, I, 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 I traveled with the Pope. I went with the Pope all the way because I was deeply interested to see the reconciliation of the church with the indigenous people. And of course, when, when the Pope annulled the, the papal bulls, it was a wonderful thing. But where is the state in all of this? Where is the federal government in all of this? So now you have declared me persona non grata. I am going to get fired, but let me stop right there. Save me from myself, please, Eileen. So, so there's there's one more question. So it's yeah, yeah, one, one more, Brian. Let me follow your excellency in terms of you talking about reconciliation as a process, not as an event. And it's not only Canada, there are many countries around the world struggling how to move in the direction of reconciliation and healing. Some even are afraid, scared to get to the, that space, the space of reconciliation. And given your experience in South Africa, given that South Africa's courage as a people and its leaders, what will be your advice to the rest of the world? What the path of reconciliation should be? What did the mental agility required, the heart required, the spirit required to move in that direction? What would be your advice, Your Excellency? My brother, let me, let me just say that, you know, I started off this discussion with those three wonderful concepts. Mitakuye o Yasin, we are all related. You introduced the word saubona, I see you. And the concept of Ubuntu, I exist because you are. Now, there is something very inherent in all three of those. It is all based on the interconnectedness to the other. I see you. We are all related. I am because you are. Now, that is such incredible philosophy of a shared humanity that I think everyone needs to embrace. We've got to start from the basis that you embrace the other. Embrace the other. If you're unable to embrace the other, there can be no reconciliation, period. What you could have is people, is Peaceful coexistence. You can have peaceful coexistence, but you will not have reconciliation. Reconciliation is about deeply, fundamentally, each of us is a human being looking to the other person and embracing the other human being as a human being, not lesser, not more superior. And there's this wonderful book that I would advise everyone to read, it's called Cast, C-A-S-T, by uh, Laurel Wilkinson, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a book about caste. Caste in the United States of America. Caste, in part in, in Canada, of how we have a, domin a, dominating, a dominant group and a subservient group, and how this passes on, and is also passing on now to the new Canadian. So we have 
indigenous Canadians, we have settler Canadians, and now we're going to have the new Canadians in regard to, to, to immigrants. We've got to break the cycle of othering. We've got to break the cycle of the othering. And the more we talk about it, the better we will be. Now, the specific methodology, the specific methodology of how we get there. I don't believe we always have to get there through catastrophic confrontation. And I, I'm, I, I embrace peace. I'm a peace warrior. Uh, I will not engage in catastrophic con uh, confrontation. But I will also not embrace in the silencing of the voice of victims. Now, part of the problem is the willful blindness and the, and the willful deniability of dominant groups in every society. They do not want to see the harm that has been done on others because in part, they fear by acknowledging the harm that was done to others, that their privilege in society today will be diminished and that their privilege will be taken away from them. So in yes, part and parcel of why South Africa's negotiation was successful is that we accepted the fears of the other side. We understood that our white compatriots were fearful in terms of what they would have to give up for our freedom. And once we, we, we could negotiate a paradigm in which they didn't have to give up anything in their lives. They just simply had to embrace freedom for everybody. It made an enormous uh, difference. Of course, it's not as easy as I say it is. It took many years. It's still taking many years, but there has to be agency. There has to be human agency amongst all of us. Do not ever give up on the ability to raise your voice. Do not give up on the ability to organize against injustice. Do not give up on your ability to conscientize thousands, millions of people around moral causes. We, and I tell you that, because I am a beneficiary of your work. I am a beneficiary of your efforts to free South Africa, to liberate South Africa, all the global anti-apartheid movements, etc., led to our freedom. Why did we stop? Why did we stop at South Africa only? There's nothing stopping us from mobilizing again, organizing again, and raising the injustices that is visited on the indigenous people the world over including here in Canada. We will take one last yeah. thing. Oh, whatever you want to do. Let's no. wrap up. Get any more questions there? There's several, so we're not going to get to them all anyway. Okay. I think uh, His Excellency has been very generous with his time, uh, and we have kept him more than uh, the time we have expected. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Cody Institute fundamental principle is building a relationship coming together, acting together, and, and solving problems together. And we hope one day you will visit us here in our campus in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Uh, now I will pass it to my executive director, uh, Eileen, uh, to give us our closing statement. And uh, we are grateful for your time, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, um, Your Excellency. I wish we had another hour or two, because what I think this has done is provoked even more thinking and more conversation than we are able to uh, to meet today and especially when I'm seeing the questions that are that are listed on the board um, online here but I, I I will pick up on something that I think um, I'm I was mapping out as you were speaking and it was really around uh, it got me thinking about how we're defining reconciliation in the first place. And if you look back at just a dictionary definition, it could be, um, as I looked it up, the restoration of friendly relations. That's reconciliation. Or the action of making one view or belief compatible with another. 
that's reconciliation. But it, in actual fact, those different steps, and certainly the steps that you took us through as you were sharing the history of, of you know, South Africa in, 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 the, modern, in the modern era um, and the different, you know, main events that have happened, you 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 touched on quite a lot there um and what was prominent to me was the efforts around eradicating settler, settler colonialism or decolonization as we might refer mm -hmm. to here in Canada and and then you talked about um a number of things that can lead to you know harmony amongst us um you know so that we're moving just beyond what you called peaceful coexistence i think in some ways i don't know how peaceful it is but we could say that we have a modicum of peaceful coexistence right now in canada the step that goes next i think is important for us and you know we talk certainly amongst settler communities about reconciliation and our need to move in that direction and, you know i hear from my indigenous colleagues Actually, the reconciliation part, that's on you to figure out. But what comes first, decolonizing or reconciling? And, you know, I think in some ways we're trying to start with reconciliation without the hard work around decolonization. Yes. And then yet, if we do that, if we take on decolonization, um, you know, what does that imply? What does that, what does that actually do in terms of creating a bit more of a, of a of a chaos that nobody seems to be really wanting to get into. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the Indian Act, which you know, in some ways, a simplistic way could be, we could just say, let's eradicate the Indian Act. But on both sides, there's you know, it, it's clear there's much more nuance to what's in the Indian Act that we need to unpack. Um, because there was conditions in there that are also beneficial to the, you know, to Indigenous peoples, but the vast majority of it being not conducive to them living a full and abundant life. So decolonization and reconciliation almost being interchanged um, in our discourse is, can be problematic. And then once you get through both of those, should we ever get to that stage, then it's all about sustained action. And I think you would agree with me that there, there's also lessons for South Africa to continue because you made it through an, a, a very important moment of, of reconciliation. And, but how do you sustain that? How do you ensure that actions continue that way? Are, you know, as the questions are being asked, you know, are people's lives for the better now? What do we need to continue to build? Um, and that's the work of every government going, who've either gone through decolonization or not, or reconciliation or not. So sustained action. And then with that comes preventative measures like education and awareness. All of that then hopefully leading to that Ubuntu that you talk about and that as we talk about full and abundant life. So there's so many stages here that you've kind of got us all reflecting on. Um, but, you know, just to end on saying that um, I really appreciate you taking this time to actually open up the, that door of and, and that conversation, that Pandora's box, if you will, of, of different ideas um, and also shedding the light on our responsibility as Canadians um, to not just um, do the preaching, but also the practicing um, as we would ask others to do around the world. And I think that's where we have a lot of work to do. I don't think you got yourself out of a job just yet. I think um, most Canadians um, are really starting to realize um, the importance of, of the work that they have to do individually and collectively to go there. So thank you so much for your time today. And I'm looking forward to having more times uh, that we can get together and, and further these conversations collectively. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Sorry about the technical hitches. And I commit because I, <clears throat> I love institutions like yours. Uh, this is the good work that we should be doing. So feel free, hassle me, get me back again. Uh, I will more than willing, more than willing to participate again. And thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Degapi, and everybody who's on the call today, as well as in the room um, here in our building at Cody. 
Thank you. Ciao, Daniel. Bye. Bye.